spending a week at the bottom of the ocean is pretty much as crazy as it sounds. You get into a tin can with a couple of other people and they lower you into the ocean. You sink to the sea floor and you live in the airspace at the top of the can for a week. There's not a lot of space when you're breathing fresh air down there, so the only reason to go is if you like to scuba. Just, that's all there is to do down there. Normally you get an hour of dive time for each tank of oxygen you're carrying, so every hour you have to go back up to the surface from the bottom of the ocean, which takes time. When you're living down there, it's different. Your dive time becomes limited only by your endurance. So we set up fast refill stations and high-powered hoses to fill our tanks with oxygen. That way you can stay in the water as long as you want. Hours fly by while you're down there. You can never get bored. It's a whole different planet on the seafloor. Who wouldn't want to spend all day staring at aliens? Fish of countless varieties swim past in all colors of the rainbow. Sea turtles and octopus, dolphins and manta rays, sharks and whales, you see it all. Not to mention the unparalleled beauty of the coral reefs themselves. And all the plethora of life forms that dwell symbolically within it. The only thing I didn't like was nighttime at the bottom of the ocean. So you'd look out from the habitat unto utter blackness. Darker than anything you've ever seen. And how can you not imagine what's out there? We had seen sharks, giant octopus, barracudas swimming nearby. There's also everything else your imagination can come up with. Everything you've seen on movies and TV that isn't even real. Amorphous humanoids who look like swamp things who creep up silently from the kelp and grab your arm with their hands dotted with suckers like the tentacles of an octopus. Giant krakens, massive dinosaur sharks left over from the Jurassic period, and all the manner of nightmares that could be out in the darkness. You spend a week down there, you begin to realize, too, just how ignorant we are of the world that exists in tandem with ours. You try to avoid those thoughts. They're out of the habitat at night. You have to leave the habitat to go to the bathroom, so there's no avoiding it if you need to go number two. One night I was awoken by a rumbling in my stomach around 3 a.m., dark inside the tin can that we called home, silent except for the sound of waves splashing up against the inside of my hab. My stomach lurched again, this time more urgently. I realized I'd need to go outside. I put my mask on, but didn't take my regulator or oxygen, since the little hut we used as a toilet wasn't far away, maybe 20 feet, and I could easily hold my breath for that long. The light from the hut gleamed ahead of me as I dove down into the darkness, my mind still foggy with sleep. The dim bulb in the outhouse was the only other light in the universe, so I went to it with urgency for more than one reason. When I got there, I popped up into the little air bubble inside and pulled down my trunks. I'd made it just in time. Pretty soon fish were coming by for their morning meal, and I swatted them with my hands, trying to pinch off before they could burrow their faces further on my ass. Sweet fish just loved to eat shit. And if it wasn't nightmarish enough, it was that blackness. All around, except for the light from the outhouse and the one from the habitat, the darkness stretched out forever. and was infinite in its mystery wondered how far away the nearest great white shark was, and if they'd be attracted to the scent of all the smaller fish. I shook my head and tried to think of anything else. It was completely silent except for my breathing and the sound of water splashing gently against the inside of the hut. I finally pulled up my trunks, slapped the fish with my hand as I did so, and waited for a minute for the air to clear, so to speak. No sense rushing the dive back into the blackness, I thought, especially considering what I'd just polluted it with. After a minute, I took a deep breath, popped back into the water from the air bubble, and swam towards the light of the habitat. When I was not even halfway there, both lights flickered and went out. I was immediately disoriented. My foggy mind had been asleep a few minutes ago, and I wished that I'd taken longer to wake up before venturing out alone. I hadn't even woken anyone else up to tell them where I was going. The afterimage of the glow from the habitat still danced in my vision. So I followed it, my heart beating fast and heavy in my chest. I felt terrified, and I hoped that I was heading in the right direction. 
I followed my instincts and training and tried to ignore the part of my brain that told me that I might not be going the right way. It felt something large brush against my hand and recoiled in shock. The hell was that? I wondered. I was suddenly picturing a giant hammerhead right in front of me instead of the habitat. My panic intensified. My vision was starting to go a bit red around the edges, and I wondered how much time I had wasted. It was a good thing that I could hold my breath for a long period. I, tr I tried to swim in the direction of the habitat, but I suddenly wasn't sure which way it was anymore. The thing that had brushed against my hand, had, it felt large. It, it scared me more than a bit. Kicking my flippers, I began swimming in the direction that I thought was right. My hand brushed up against it again. Whatever it was, this time it was on the other side of me. I, I tried to ignore my fear and kept kicking my legs. My vision was beginning to flood with redness, and I was, I was really starting to feel true dread and fear blossom inside me like I had never felt before. Every part of me was screaming for air. I tried to calm my mind and remember my training. My hand grabbed onto something, and in my confusion and oxygen-deprived state, I mistook it for a power line, running to the outhouse. I began to pull myself along the misshapen tube. It seemed to squirm and writhe in my hand, but I continued along nonetheless, hoping that it would lead me back to the habitat. As I got closer, I felt more and more of the weird, organically-shaped tubes. They felt lumpy. They had spikes in them, and divots here and there. And I realized, with disgust, that they were definitely not oxygen or electrical lines. They seemed to stick to my hands when I grabbed onto them, not wanting to let go. I, I had to pry my hand off the last time I decided to stop touching them altogether. Just as I was about to lose all hope, my left hand brushed against the hard, metallic edge of the habitat. I had almost gone by it. I realized with a wave of horrified relief, I had almost swam right past it and out into the open water. I felt the shape of it and managed to correct my path. I popped my head up into the habitat and gasped for air, panting and coughing up water from my lungs. I climbed out of the water, and I managed to find the ladder leading up to my bunk. Fuck! I almost died out there just now! I yelled. I was surprised when no one woke up to ask if I was okay. I felt new fear well up inside me, thinking of all the tangled organisms that had been all over the outside of the habitat. The hell were those things? Why wasn't anyone talking or waking up inside the hab? I rummaged through my things and pulled out my flashlight, wishing that I I brought it with me earlier. How stupid. If I died, I would have deserved it. I turned the light on. And screamed. There was no rational explanation for what I saw inside the habitat. The other two members of my crew were surrounded by what, a, what appeared to be misshapen tentacles, but no, that's not quite right. Not tentacles. These were different. The long tubular shapes that came up out of the water reminded me of a recent article about a siphonophore that had been discovered off the coast of Australia. It was now recorded as the longest creature ever seen by man. It was it was really a collection of zooids that came together and cloned itself thousands upon thousands of times to create an infinitely long, silly string that could stretch for hundreds of meters. The crew had called it akin to an underwater galaxy. In pictures, the siphonophore looked otherworldly. It went on forever, a twisting, spiraling organism that faded off into the distant ocean, with no end in sight. This was like that, only much worse. This siphonophore appeared to have mutated. It had picked up some new abilities never seen before in all my research. The thing had absorbed other marine life somehow. I saw. Barracudas with sharp teeth, small sharks, eels with their eyes wide and terrified, opening and closing their mouths. They were covered with thin membranes and appeared to have been attached to the thing against their will. They were now prisoners of it, being dragged along by the massive ropey sea creature. My crew had the tentacle things all around them, choking them at their necks and wrapped around their bodies and arms. The white flesh of the thing was, was spreading across them quickly, wrapping them up in its slimy sheath. And my crewmate Mike, he tried to scream, but his voice was muffled as I saw a vine of siphonophore crawl down his throat, planting little roots as it went. I was terrified, hyperventilating, 
I ducked back into the furthest corner of my bunk and I watched in horror as the thing consumed my crewmates rapidly and attached itself to them. I watched as it pulled them under and dragged them down into the ocean. Their eyes still wide and afraid. Would it filter the ocean water through its gills so they could live down there, I wondered? Would it provide oxygen to the new members of the colony or would it... Would it consume them for fuel and move on? No one would believe me if I told them what happened. So I said it was a diving accident. I told them I tried to save Mike and Beth and there, there wasn't anything I could do. A search party had turned up nothing as I expected. When I got back to the surface, I told my family I would never... S Never step foot in the sea again. They think I just feel bad about Mike and Beth, but that's not... That's not it. I feel bad about them, sure, but... But what I really think about is what's down there. Under the surface. I saw how fast that thing consumed them. I think about the transatlantic garbage patch and how it was... The big problem for a while. I think we might have a new problem now. Hey there, kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I just wanted to say thank you so much for watching tonight's video. Or watching tonight, or listening to tonight's podcast, because it's also a podcast on Spotify, or on Apple, or on Google, or anywhere else you can listen to the podcast. So, as you know, uh, just about every single convention this year has been cancelled. However, there is something fun that I think all of you might like, and that's the HorrorCon VR. HorrorCon VR is a project that I've picked up with, as well as a group of my friends, to help become a reality. HorrorCon VR is going to be hosted in VR chat, and you don't need a headset or virtual reality to be able to play it. You just need a computer or a laptop. So if you guys are interested in finding out more, you can head over to HorrorConVR.com or you can check us out on Twitter at Horror underscore VR. And lastly, as always, I want to remind you guys, if you ever want to support the show, you can do so at Patreon.com slash MrCreepyPasta. And I really appreciate any time you guys can support the show because honestly, I love you guys. <laughs> You're all awesome. So but a very special thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez. Ha ha sa ha. Ken Lenda Higuchi, Mazakin, Champinsky, The Red Oak Shield Virus, G Weevil 3, Diana Krause, Stephen Van Huss, Chance Burnett, Tristan Pelton, Nico Cow, The Ginger Bros, Last Blade Song, Caleb Dougal, Sky Harbor, The Homeless Bird 93, Bobby Karen, Liam Newman, Aaron Stormcrow, Barbara Maceo, Thomas Burgett, S Man, Kiri the Sloth, Bad Honey, Someone You Love, Said the King 56, Shadow Morningstar, Mad Marshtomp, Mr. Thud, Patrick Schoolmeister, Z. Kearley, Wolfie Nums, Rafael Rodriguez, W.R. Axis, Prozac and Pancakes, Mike Bullock, Acid System, Lauren, Brian Arse, and Rumble Fox. And also a huge thank you to everybody who's down there in the description down below. You guys, as always, are the real MVPs, and I appreciate you more than I can possibly say. So thank you guys, thank you all for listening, and sweet dreams. <laughs>